Good afternoon. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. I'm Allison Stanger, and I'm director of the Roatan Center for International Affairs at Middlebury College, and like to welcome you to today's event, uh, which is sponsored by the Roatan Center for International Affairs, the Program in Environmental Studies, the Office of Environmental Affairs, the Career Services Office, and Atwater Commons. It's part of an ongoing collaboration uh, be, uh, in a series on corporate social responsibility that's been going on all year. We still have another event later in April. And it's been a, a genuine collaborative venture and a lot of fun. Uh, but today's lecture is the one I've probably personally looked forward to the most. Uh, I met our speaker for the first time today, but I feel like I already know him uh, through his ideas. Uh, his book, The Market for Virtue, significantly influenced my own thinking on related issues. And then I discovered that my colleague in political science, uh, Chris Kleiza, had read the book and had also been similarly impressed. So we put our heads together and said, gee, wouldn't it be great uh, to try to get David Vogel to come to Middlebury College? And decided to try. And we asked, and he accepted. And we're thrilled that he's with us here today. Uh, so it's my great honor and pleasure now to introduce you to him. Uh, this is David Vogel. He's the Solomon P. Lee Distinguished Professor of Business Ethics and also a professor of political science uh, at Berkeley. He has a dual appointment, I believe, in both the Haas School of Business and the Political Science Department. He was educated at Queens College, the City University of New York, and then received his PhD from Princeton University in political science. Professor Vogel is the editor of the California Management Review, and he's the author or editor of many books, most recently, Corporate Responsibility, Government, and Civil Society, published by Oxford in 2008, What's the Beef? The Contested Governance of European Food Safety, uh, published by MIT in 2006, and then The Market for Virtue, the book that Professor Kleiser and I read and love so much, uh, by Brookings in 2006. His talk today is titled, The Market for Virtue, A Critical Appraisal of the Potential and Limits of Corporate Social Responsibility. Uh, please join me in welcoming to Middlebury, Professor David Vogel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, what I want to do is uh, lay out some of the perspectives that I've come out of my own thinking and research about corporate social responsibility, um, and then also to conclude by suggesting some of the ways in which uh, corporate social responsibility is changing or is being challenged by the current global financial crisis, sort of where is it going in the future. Let me begin by defining what I, how I define corporate social responsibility. How I define it is activities which companies engage in which address various social, environmental, public, human rights concerns, a broad range of issues, which are voluntary, which are not legally required, which go beyond legal requirements. So if a company is engaging in a particular policy, you know, environmental protection, not discriminating, et cetera, and it's required to do so by the law, I don't view that as corporate responsibility. Corporate responsibility are voluntary acts which companies do which go beyond legal requirements, more than they're legally required to do. So the punishment, in other words, for being irresponsible is never a, a legal punishment. It could be through the marketplace, but it's not uh, through, through the role of government. And so one way of thinking about this is what corporate responsibility means is that when we look at a company, we hold it, we look at it, and we hold it to standards. We have expectations of it, which go beyond a financial and economic performance. So one, here's, for example, by the triple bottom line. We judge a company, people, planet, profits, which is to say we look at a company, we judge it by its financial performance, conventionally. Uh, we also judge it by its impact on people, the welfare of human beings whose life it affects, and we also judge it by its environmental impact. Um, so the whole notion of a triple bottom line, where people talk about economic, social, uh, and environmental, the whole notion is that what corporate responsibility is essentially is about is expanding our expectations of how we judge companies. So that we look at a firm, 
and we say, okay, we judge it by its financial performance, how well is it performing for its shareholders, how profitable it is, conventional, and in addition, we also judge it by various standards of social environmental performance. And so what the social responsibility movement has done to implement this is to a whole huge variety of awards and recognitions which we give to companies rating them on, this, on their corporate social responsibility. So we have uh, the Ethical Corporation magazine, for example, has a list each year of the 100 most ethical corporations in the United States. Uh, we have uh, a Fortune publishes a list, uh, the, the 100 best companies to work for. We have a list of the 100 best co companies which treat women best, family friendly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a whole variety, we have a list of uh, companies which have superior environmental performance. Uh, if you look at the, um, uh, the social responsible mutual funds, uh, which have now become global, um, for them, that's also a measure where they judge a company to include them, to include X company in their fund. Uh, the question is, uh, does it meet these various social and environmental criteria? Okay. So we have a whole variety of mechanisms. There's a whole consulting industry, all these awards, and the whole idea is to try to foster and encourage uh, these expectations of corporations um, to focus, to have them think about um, other things be in addition to um, profitability. Now, I think what's most striking about this movement for corporate responsibility is the way it's grown and spread over the last 15 or 20 years. Um, it's become a global phenomenon uh, uh, in, in very many uh, important ways. Uh, I'll give you one indication. Social or ethical mutual funds, uh, which began in the United States, uh, now exist in almost every single capital market in the world. Almost every country has such funds. There are about 800 of them globally. Um, if you look at uh, the number of firms which have um, uh, issued issue social environmental reports, uh, again, it has uh, mushroomed. 80% of the largest 250 firms in the world issue annual reports on their corporate responsibility. Um, and again, these are increasingly um, becoming global. Uh, uh, you look at the U.S. Global Compact, which is a broad ethical standard. Um, over 3,000 global firms have subscribed to it. Um, so what's really striking is the extent to which the norms of corporate responsibility, this, the internalization of these expectations, has become a global phenomenon. Where uh, I was recently at a conference in Cairo, uh, which also has a CSR program uh, and rates companies and has these expectations and awards, et cetera. Um, and the other dimension of this, which I think is very important globally, is the rise of voluntary industry standards, where groups of firms get together and establish standards of social environmental performance, which they voluntarily agree to bind themselves with. Um, and we now have actually um, more than 250 industry codes, uh, and the, they keep on mushrooming. We have codes for forestry, many of them. We have the codes for chemicals, computers, electronic equipment, apparel, rugs, coffee, tea, cocoa, palm oil, diamonds, gold, jewelry, toys, mining, energy, tourism, financial services, athletic equipment, buildings, etc. In other words, we have just this multiplicity of industry after industry, and these are global codes where major firms get together um, and decide that we are going to hold ourselves to various standards. Um, of, as specified in these codes, um, which again go beyond uh, legal requirements. So this is really a very striking phenomenon which has grown by leaps and bounds um, and, and shows, I think, no signs um, of diminishing. Uh, and the, so the first question to think about is sort of what accounts for this? Why do we see such a spread of corporate responsibility? Why has it become rare, very rare, to find a corporation which doesn't have a corporate responsibility report, which doesn't have advertising touting its social and environmental commitments. Uh, if you want to just check this, go on any firm you can think of, go on their website, and you will, chances are overwhelmingly, you will find they have a social or environmental responsibility report. And they have some officials who are in charge of corporate social and environmental responsibility. Um, it's really become very much, um, very, very common. So the question is, one question is, why, what accounts for this spread of embrace of corporate responsibility by global corporations? One is, I think, it's a response to public criticism. 
Uh, some people talk about define CSR, corporate social responsibility, and they label it, they relabel it corporate scandal response. And I think that's insightful. If you look at the origins of corporate responsibility, they're naming and shaming campaigns conducted by, against firms, say, like Nike, most dramatically, um, against forestry companies, against banks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Activists get together, they challenge companies, they picket, they try to boycott them, they humiliate them, embarrass them, et cetera, et cetera. And companies caring about their reputations um, often respond to these criticisms uh, by changing their policies and adopting CSR policies. Um, companies, particularly brand companies, care about their reputation. Coca-Cola, for example, is just, you know, flavored bottled water. Um, basically, they, it's the brand is everything, okay? And things, when people make allegations that uh, Coke, for example, is, um, is uh, using water supplies in India uh, for its products, um, which, um, which is depriving local people of adequate water supplies, Coke is concerned, okay, when there are allegations that Coke, for example, uh, that people in Coke bottling plants in Colombia um, are being, uh, workers who try to join unions, organized unions are being killed uh, with the support of uh, the local government and the implicit uh, argument in support of Coke, Coke's embarrassed, okay. And so that global firms with global brands, and there are lots and lots of them, any brand you can think of, those firms feel very vulnerable. And it just would take a little bit to get people to switch uh, from Nike to Reebok, right? From Coke to Pepsi, et cetera, et cetera. So people have lots of choices. Companies worry about their reputation. So part of it is, is a response to criticism. And if you haven't been criticized yet, you might be worried you will be criticized. So another way of thinking about corporate responsibility is it's part of a corporate insurance policy to create goodwill, to establish a good reputation. So if you get in trouble, maybe you'll be a little less harshly criticized than if you hadn't had those CSR policies to begin with. Uh, or maybe you might avoid the um, criticisms to begin with. So that's one set of factors. A second part of the growth of CSR is, I think, um, internal, coming from executives and employees. Many executives, someone just told me you had a talk uh, from Don Fisher from The Gap. Um, there are many people who run companies, CEOs, um, who have values, who care about things, who want to make the world a better place, who don't want the companies to uh, do ill in the world. Um, there are many employees, people who work for firms, who care about their firm's reputation. Um, a lot of CSR, uh, and there are you know, many cases of, of corporations, for example, um, a company like Seventh Generation uh, or, or, or Ben & Jerry's, which have been founded, or The Body Shop, which, whose basic business mission is to be both profitable and responsible from the very beginning. So I think there's a lot of internal pressure on the part of companies, on the part of executives, on the part of managers, who actually embrace this and think this is something which they should do for its own sake, on an ethical sort of basis. The third dimension, I think, of this growth, uh, which is linked to these others, it's become a norm. Okay? Business is very faddish. Companies follow what other companies are doing. They're always worried, about, always follow what other firms are doing. Very aware of this. Okay? One X firm establishes a CSR program, a corporate contributions program, a community development program, uh, gets some awards for its green programs and policies, um, engages in a creative recycling program, cuts its energy use, um, works with local groups in developing countries to improve their welfare and community relations, uh, and tries to improve working conditions in, in, um, in, uh, in, in sweatshops and factories and farms in developing countries, et cetera, et cetera, tries to improve their forestry practices. When one firm does it, often other firms feel that they should do it as well. And I think CSR in many ways has grown in part because for many companies, it's a business norm. It's sort of what you do. Okay? Um, I was recently a, a few years ago at a conference, um, someone from, this is sort of, in perspective, a little bizarre, but this is from AIG um, and uh, uh, the big insurance firm. And um, uh, their CEO uh, was watching uh, Goldman Sachs, which had carved out a very strong environmental footprint, doing lots of environmental things, um, and getting a reputation as the green, the green firm on Wall Street. And he turns to his senior managers and says, we want to be, a, why should they get all this credit? I want to be as green as they are. What can we do to also be responsible? And to you know to compete with them uh, by being virtuous, um, 
So these, these, uh, these sort of normative factors, imitation, I think, are important. Um, another factor is, I think, in some cases, the fear of regulation. Um, CSR can be seen as a way of avoiding regulation or of anticipating regulation. So in the case of place climate change in the US, you might argue a prudent company might wish to engage in climate change programs which are not yet required by the law because they're anticipating that they will be required at some future point, and therefore there'll be an advantage compared to their competitors who've been sort of laggards um, on, these, um, on these issues. Um, so basically, there are a whole host of reasons um, why companies have embraced corporate responsibility. But by far the most influential reason, and the one I want to talk about in most detail, is the argument that companies are embracing corporate responsibility because it makes business sense for them to do so. Now, this is a very powerful argument. Um, and it's a very uh, intriguing argument. The notion is, to put it broadly, um, consumers are increasingly rewarding companies who they see as responsible, voting with their dollars, and punishing firms whom they see as irresponsible. Employees, People want to work for firms that are responsible and are more reluctant to work for firms that are less responsible. Investors increasingly care about corporate responsibility and wish to put their money in firms which are responsible uh, rather than firms which they view as irresponsible. So the notion is, in effect, that there is a market for virtue, which is to say there's demand from consumers, investors, and employees for companies to be virtuous. And companies will, in fact, respond, therefore, by being more virtuous. And in the long run, one can expect more virtuous companies to grow and prosper, less virtuous companies to suffer as they lose the patronage of consumers, investors, and employees. Um, and in the long run, uh, there'll be more virtuous firms and less fewer virtuous firms. So that is basically the business case for CSR, that companies are engaging in corporate responsibility because it makes business sense. It's good for their reputation. It's good for employee morale. Uh, having a better environmental program is a way of reducing your costs. It's a way of opening up new business opportunities by marketing ethical products, organic, organic products, for example, or more environmentally efficient products. Um, uh, or um, you know, more uh, diamonds that you can assure people uh, weren't uh, uh, blood diamonds, um, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, there's business arguments why, in the, why being more responsible will in the long run make you more profitable. And this is very, uh, a very powerful argument. Um, and of course, it's a very seductive argument, um, which is why executives believe it overwhelmingly. Um, the whole ethical fund industry, of course, rests on this argument. If you invest in our funds, not only will you make, you make the world a better place, but you'll make more money. Um, uh, business students embrace this dramatically because it means they can go into business and try to make as much money as they can and don't have to give up being responsible because, after all, the firms that will pay them the best will also be the most profitable and, therefore, because they're the most responsible. Um, governments like it because it's a way of companies can do lots of things without being required to do so through the law. It's a very, um, it's a very attractive notion, um, and it's very widely believed. And I would go far as far as to say most everyone who writes about corporate responsibility basically embraces this point of view, basically that being, being responsible uh, makes good sense for business, good business sense in a way. Um, Unfortunately, um, the evidence, I would argue, for this um, world, uh, this vision, um, is on the whole quite thin. Um, and, and this is sort of disappointing. I was recently giving a talk uh, for a group of um, people who do corporate contributions, who run uh, corporate programs that give out money. And I gave my opening remarks, and then I talked about the business case and how attractive it was, and everyone in the audience agreed that they, they liked it. And then I said, unfortunately, the evidence for it is pretty weak. And there was like murmurings and hissing throughout the crowd. This was, they were very upset to hear this. Um, and my students are also get very upset when I make this claim. So this is not a popular argument. Um, uh, but I think on, on balance, the evidence um, supports it. 
Now, the good news is, and this is important to note, the good news is that more responsible firms do not do less well. That's the good news. The market doesn't punish firms because they're too responsible. The bad news is it doesn't reward firms for being more responsible, nor does it punish firms for being irresponsible. Um, and I think the reason why this doesn't work is ultimately when people interact with companies, at the end of the day, they mostly care about their own self-interest. They're not interested in virtue. They're not interested in their own values. They want value, in a sense. Okay? So when people go out and buy things, when you and I, all day long, consume goods and services, very few of us, very little of the time, ever make the effort to think about, find out about, something about the corporation's performance and allow that to judge our business decisions. Um, we might buy uh, fluorescent light bulbs. Um, we might buy organic food. Uh, we might buy some fair trade products. There are certainly little, small niche markets in ethical consumption, but they're very small. Uh, most people, when they think about what to buy, they think about price, they think about convenience, they think about quality. They don't think much about uh, broader issues. Um, and that's unfortunately um, true. Uh, I don't see it changing. Um, and that's, of course, a big constraint, um, which I think at the, at the end of the day, um, uh, people mostly care, overwhelmingly care about uh, their own, what they view as their own short-term economic self-interest. That's how the capitalism works. They don't think about and care about um, and, and bother to look into uh, how the product was made. So when you go and buy a pair of athletic shoes or buy a T-shirt or buy any other athletic equipment or all the normal clothing which you buy, you know, 99% of which is made in developing countries, um, you and I have no idea about how it's made, whether it's made responsibly or irresponsibly. Uh, the effort it would take to find out is pretty overwhelming. Um, and the fact that at the end of the day, uh, if something is a better, seems like a better product, uh, that's what you're going to buy, uh, not because um, it, it, um, uh, because it meets some social and environmental criteria. Employees, um, there are employees who may care about these issues. People go on the job market. Um, uh, but um, actually, when you look at how people make decisions who to work for, again, they care about salaries, they care about benefits, they care about promotion, they care about the workplace environment. Uh, caring about the social and environmental performance of the firm for most people is pretty, um, again, pretty modest, pretty marginal. And investors, you know, investors matter. The fact is that conventional investment analysts, and basically conventional funds are about 98% of all mutual funds, only about 2% of the mutual fund market are ethical funds. Conventional managers, when, they, when analysts look at a, re, a company, by and large, are pretty indifferent to how it's, it's social and environmental performance. They don't really care. And if you want a sort of proof of this, um, you know, go on you know, Yahoo or any of the financial websites, pick a random company, follow its, you know, what people say about it uh, when you click on the stock price for a period of days, weeks, months, and there'll be people who say buy, sell, hold, Things look good, things look poor. You know, the usual panoply of, of investment advice. Um, and you will very rarely see any analyst report saying, buy this firm because it seems to be more responsible. Or sell this company. Um, their environmental record seems pretty weak. Okay. You rarely see this. That is to say, with all the literature we have on corporate social environmental responsibility, um, for most analysts, people who buy and sell shares who determine how the market functions, uh, it falls below the radar screen. Um, there's a social responsibility movement. We'd love to change this. Uh, puts a lot of effort into trying to persuade managers that they should look at companies and care about their response to climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's rough sledding. Um, and, in, and to date, um, by and large, there are exceptions, but by and large, for the financial markets um, are indifferent. Now, the other reason, I think, why it's hard to sort of correlate corporate responsibility and financial performance is that corporate responsibility is a very multidimensional concept. So that a particular firm is often responsible in some areas and less responsible in other areas. 
and it's hard to know which are the ones that are going to affect financial performance. Let me give you two examples. Okay. British Petroleum, uh, which changed its name to Beyond Petroleum, um, has received considerable acclaim for its um, very progressive policies on climate change. Uh, Lord Brown, their CEO, was the first oil company executive in the world to identify and legitimate and accept the reality of climate change and embarked on a variety of programs, including reducing his own energy, is also investing in solar, to try to um, reduce dependence on fossil fuels. Okay. BP has gotten enormous, well-deserved credit from environmentalists for its very progressive, gutsy stance on climate change. Exo the, the corporation, which is probably hated more by any other corporation in the world, uh, uh, largely because of its climate change policy, is ExxonMobil. Uh, ExxonMobil has persistently denied the legitimacy of climate change. So recently it's funded extensively, um, it's extensively funded um, uh, various organizations which are skeptical of the case for global climate change. Um, uh, and it also refuses to invest in alternative energy on the grounds that it's a waste of their shareholders' money. Okay. So if you're going to judge these firms by climate change, you would say, well, BP is more responsible than ExxonMobil. Fair enough. However, a few years ago, BP had made two major catastrophes in the U.S. They had an explosion in their oil refinery in Houston, Texas, uh, killing and maiming large numbers of people, the worst occupational health and safety disaster in the U.S. in, in modern time, recent times. It turns out it was their fault. They had neglected to upkeep their, uh, uh, their equipment and indeed lobbied against local laws uh, that tried to get them to spend more money on equipment on safety equipment. Uh, they also had a spill in Alaska in the pipeline. BP owns the Alaska pipeline um, as a, one of the managers of it, which, of course, affected the permafrost, et cetera. How, and on the other hand, since 89, with the Exxon Valdez oil spill, ExxonMobil has had the best record of an environmental and occupational health and safety performance of any oil company in the world. I have had a perfect record. No occupational health and safety deaths, no spills. So, if you judge the firm by the way it's occupational health and safety, ExxonMobil looks like a more responsible firm. If you judge these two firms by their impact on the physical environment in the United States, ExxonMobil looks a lot more responsible. So, which of these two firms is more responsible? Well, the answer is, of course, it depends on your values. Which of these two things you value more, right? And a lot of corporate responsibility really does involve political judgments. Uh, and you, have, you can make your choice as to which of these firms you like better. That's fine. But it also means that it's pretty difficult to sort of correlate their profits with corporate responsibility because it's hard to know how you're measuring corporate responsibility. Let me give you another more prosaic example. Um, uh, from about a firm you're probably um, familiar with. How many of you have uh, heard of or purchased products from American Apparel? I haven't, but I just was raising the hand in solidarity. Okay. American Apparel is a very interesting company. Uh, they're, uh, they make um, clothing. Um, and um, in terms of uh, labor standards, they're really extraordinary. American Apparel, 100% of their products are made in the United States. Only apparel company which does that. They're made, all made in, in uh, California, domestically. Um, their workers are treated extremely well. Factory is air conditioned. Um, their wages are well above average. They have language training and citizenship courses for a lot of their employees who are, um, who are from Mexico. Um, and um, uh, they use, uh, they're very concerned about environmental performance. They use a lot of organic cotton. Um, on a lot of dimensions, social and environmental, American Apparel is a pretty responsible firm, unusually responsible firm. So, so far, so good. American Apparel CEO has been um, accused, legally accused, of, uh, of sexual harassment from, a, from, a, from his employees, by his employees, uh, more frequently than most of us have ever had dates. And it turns out that what he does is he finds women on the street who he thinks are attractive. And he brings them into the company, hires them, uses them as models, 
their ads are quite risque. Um, the women are posed in, um, in uh, ways which are very seductive. And then he um, sleeps with them, and then they sue him. And <laughs> they have another round of this. Okay. okay. So the question is, is American Apparel a responsible company? Well, on, one, on some dimensions, American Apparel is a very responsible company. On some other dimensions, American Apparel is a really irresponsible company. And now, these are dramatic examples. Okay, American Apparel is unusual on both dimensions, right? Okay. But I think that uh, for, if you look carefully at most companies, there are, there are probably a few companies. I think Patagonia is pretty virtuous. I think seven generations. We could imagine Ben and Jerry. You know, we could, there could be some exceptions. But on the whole, if you look around at particularly larger firms, you're going to see a very mixed picture. Very mixed picture. Um, and uh, so corporate performance has gotten better in some areas, less, less exciting in other areas. Um, but it also means, of course, that the business case is pretty hard to figure. Um, uh, if American Apparel does well, is that because of its good labor practices or in spite of its sexual harassment? Or how do we know? How do we know what matters? It's hard to know. And I think that's a real um, problem. Um, the broader issue, however, which I think is very important, is this, which is to say, for most companies most of the time, corporate social responsibility or irresponsibility is largely irrelevant to their performance. Their performance is shaped by other factors. Let me give one example, I'll give the gap, OK? The gap, based in San Francisco, um, the world's large, one of the large, largest retail apparel companies in the world, actually. Um, uh, has an exemplary record on labor standards. The Gap really uh, has put a serious effort into um, uh, to working and improving the welfare of the people in, its, in, in, its, in the, the contracting factories in developing countries uh, who make their products. Um, uh, they really have, I think, along with Nike, uh, the best, one of the best records of any firm in the world. Okay? Very serious, um, very impressive. Um, they take it very, very seriously. On the other hand, OK, so that's the good news. Now, in the last several years, this is beginning before the recession, um, the Gap has had serious financial difficulties. Um, closing down stores, laying off people, et cetera, share, share price plummeting, sales, profits, et cetera. Why has the Gap had financial difficulties? Well, it's, the fashion business is a very fickle business. People's tastes change. Um, and uh, it turns out that the Gap had a, you know, their current designer is not very good, and, and the stores look dowdy. And people are instead shopping at H and K. Okay. Um, that is to say, the Gap has lost significant market share, and and it lost its market share because when people think about where to go to buy clothing, like they would choose in the Gap, they don't think about corporate responsibility. They think about you know what's where, does the store look nice? Is the product fashionable? Is the price good? Et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, my point is. The Gap's record of corporate responsibility is not the reason why the Gap has done poorly lately. It's not the cause of the Gap's problems. But it, nor did it prevent the Gap from being hurt when it didn't meet its core business obligation, which is to make products that people find attractive and interesting, right? which they, you know, they want to go and buy. So in other words, if you looked at the history of the Gap, um, looking at how responsible it was wouldn't tell you much about how the Gap doing, but looking at the Gap's fashion appeal would. And I think that's true for most companies, which is to say core responsibility at the end of the day simply is overshadowed by other business risks and opportunities. Now, I think there are a, one important implication of this is that if there was a market for virtue, and if companies were rewarded for being more responsible, then of course more companies would be more responsible. And we wouldn't need so much regulation. And I think one of the reasons why people like the business case for CSR so much is because it means they don't have to go through the messy process of public policy and changing the laws and rules. The market will sort of take care of these problems. This is a very, I think, attractive vision. I think it's a very dangerous one. I think to the extent to which CSR can be is seen as to supplement regulation, I think it has a useful role an important role. And a lot has been accomplished, which is very impressive. 
To the extent, however, that corporate responsibility is seen as a substitute for government regulation, then I think its long-term impact could well be negative. The fact of the matter is, the things we really care about, in terms of what companies do and don't do, they're mostly going to, to affect, they're mostly going to have an impact through regulation. Let me give you, uh, you know, uh, an example. Uh, American automobiles average emit about 98, 99% less pollution per mile driven than they did in 1970. This is an extraordinary accomplishment. Each year, we drive more and more, more and more cars, and the air gets cleaner and cleaner. This is an incredible triumph over the last 35, 40 years, since 1970, okay. uh, which has dramatically improved the health of every American. No more lead in the air. The air should be filled with lead, which is very toxic for the young people. Uh, no more lead is emitted from gasoline. We've outlawed all lead gasoline. What, if, what accounts for this process? What accounts for the improvement, dramatic improvement in automobile emissions performance? Is it through people acting responsibly, who were willing to pay $500 more for a car with a catalytic converter, choosing to buy unleaded and leaded gasoline? It has nothing to do with corporate responsibility, nothing to do with markets at all. It's entirely driven by regulation. Those firms have changed their policies because the government fines them if they don't. End of story. Had we relied upon corporate responsibility to improve the, the uh, air pollution emitted by cars um, in the United States, we would still be coughing. Um, and I think, by the way, this is also true on climate change. Uh, a lot of companies have done a lot of voluntary things on climate change, been a lot of efforts, green building programs, et cetera, et cetera, uh, companies reducing their emissions, um, uh, energy efficiency. I mean, there's a lot of progress that's been made by corporations who've made a commitment to reduce um, uh, their carbon emissions. Very impressive and important and should not be criticized at all. But at the end of the day, those reductions, those voluntary reductions, are trivial. If you really think climate change is a serious problem, there's simply no substitute for regulation, um, which then forces companies to reduce their carbon emissions for whatever, whatever mechanism and doesn't make it a matter of choice. Um, I, think that's, you know, I think that's true. Now, there we look at civil rights, um, enormous progress made in reducing discrimination against women and ethnic minorities. That's not mostly due to corporate responsibility. That's due to the Civil Rights Commission, EEOC, which finds companies who discriminate. That regulation and government remain important. Um, to the extent that you don't have regulation, then CSR is a lot better than nothing. Um, but in the long run, uh, it seems to me um, that um, there isn't, uh, there's no real effective substitute for, um, for uh, the, the, the command and control for the coercive power um, uh, of, the, um, of the state. Now, I want to say, finally include a word about the future of CSR on the financial crisis. Um, a lot's been written on this in sort of magazines and newspapers. Um, I think that um, CSR is pretty well entrenched in most firms. Uh, there's little evidence of being cut back. There may be cutbacks here and there. There may be a decline in new initiatives. Um, but I think, on balance, um, Corporate responsibility has become embedded in enough companies that it's not going to be abandoned because of the financial crisis. We don't yet know how the crisis is going to affect green consumption. Um, some fancy products, organic food, for example, uh, higher priced products, do seem to be suffering. Starbucks obviously finds it more difficult to command the price premium for, um, for its coffee, et cetera. Um, you know, it's hard to know. People may or may not still be attracted to environmentally friendly products. Uh, will they want to save more money and not buy organic cotton? You know, it's hard to know how that's going to shake out. It's a bit early to say. Um, they, might be, will, they might not care as much, or they might say, well, you know, I don't have the money to, you know, to do something really fancy, like buy my new Mercedes, so maybe instead I'll buy organic cotton. Uh, that could be another way, which we don't quite know. Um, uh, uh, we'll see how that plays out. But that's something to be watched as to how, uh, whether the willingness of people to pay a price premium um, for socially responsible products or environmentally responsible products, how's that going to be affected? Um, it could go either way. It depends on a lot of people, how they look at it. They might feel they benefit from these products, and particularly from energy efficient products. It's hard to know. Um, but I, I think more, uh, and, and the environment, I think, is an area where really companies have gotten religion. Um, a lot of companies have figured out ways in which 
being greener saves them a bit of money. Not a fortune, but enough. And um, they find that attractive. I think uh, green has become important to companies. They're going to continue to do green initiatives, uh, even in spite of the recession. Uh, I was talking to a person who came to my office with chatting. She was working for a consulting firm um, that was um, hired uh, by, um, by Sony, Sony Pictures, um, to uh, give them environmental, you know, to green the company. And they were very impressed by her firm's suggestions. Um, and the, uh, within this brief period of time, uh, because of the recession, they, they fired 100 of their employees, and they hired two uh, full-time environmental officials to help them become greener. So, you know, that's an interesting sort of anecdote. I think it suggests that um, companies do think at the margin uh, that there is uh, some potential there. Um, so I, I think that a lot of these things will be, in, are, in, as I said, institutionalized. Um, they're not going to go away. I think you will see a decline in new initiatives on the part of companies. I think we're going to figure out with the recession who, which companies are serious, which companies are just going to get the PR. So there'll be a bit of a shakeout. But I don't see anything dramatic. But what I do think the financial crisis suggests to us um, is that um, there really isn't a substitute for making money, which is to say it's nice to be responsible, but if you're losing a lot of money, we're all in bad shape. Okay. So if you think about if you think about irresponsibility, we don't normally think about making highly risky financial decisions as a, in part of the CSR movement, and something which CSR people don't sort of focus on. But if you think about the decisions that um, financial institutions have made, taking enormous risks, which turned out to be catastrophic. Um, the negative social impact of those decisions is enormous. I think, by the way, just to speculate, if you added up all the horrible things companies have done in the name of profit in the last 25 years, and we could all come up with an enormous list, right? Horrible things. You put them on one side, these negatives, OK? And then you've looked at, what's the horror, what's the negative impact on people's lives by the current global recession caused in large measure by by very financially irresponsible decisions. I bet you the latter would look a lot more harmful than the former. So it seems to me maybe instead of talking, in addition to talking about corporate responsibility, we might want to start thinking about I'm sorry, corporate social responsibility. We might want to think about corporate responsibility. And it seems to me corporate responsibility involves managing a company responsibly, taking business decisions that make business sense, not taking extraordinary risks, and I think we you know, may well see, um, uh, you know, looking back when we think about um, uh, the financial crisis, um, this is not so much a crisis about corporate responsibility. It's a crisis about normal business activities, which turn out to be very irresponsible. And in a sense, if those people at AIG had done a better job of caring about AIG's profits and its shareholders and the people at Citibank, et cetera, et cetera, um, we would, of course, all be and never cared at all about that corporate responsibility, in the long run, we would probably all be much better off sitting here today than we are now. That's a depressing and sobering thought on which I will conclude. Thank you. may be in favor of genetically modified corn. 
Another is uh, Ben and Jerry. I mean, they talk a tremendous line. But as cynic would say, they're in the process of killing people with, with heart attacks. <laughs> Okay, good, thank you. Um, uh, I, by the way, I happen to agree with you on organic. I just used organic because um, it's a you know, big part of CSR. Um, uh, I, think, um, I think the evidence is pretty mixed. Um, people do tell me in India and China um, uh, that, uh, um, that organic cotton um, re does reduce pesticide deaths. Um, but I do think on balance, genetically modified cotton probably does a better job. Um, I think that's an example in which um, you know, this, um, the GM issue has not been a big CSR issue. Uh, organic has been. But I think it's an issue on regional people can disagree. Um, I agree with that. Um, on Ben & Jerry's, um, yeah, but of course they're now part of Unilever. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think, again, I think that's sort of like the American apparel story. I mean, they buy, uh, they buy milk from farmers that don't use DST and use local ingredients and buy nuts from, you know, Natives in the Amazon forest, et cetera, et cetera, and you know all that stuff, and that's pretty cool. Um, and they immortalize Jerry Garcia, um, and they um, and their products, um, uh, yeah, give people heart attacks. Yeah, I mean, whenever I've mentioned that to a Ben and Jerry's consumer, they actually get very upset. So I don't want to, that. but I think that's right. I mean, I think it's a mixed. Um, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, I think that's. I think that's. Uh, that's fair enough. A nuclear interesting issue. Um, uh, the CSR movement, the ethical fund movement, basically uh, uh, do, will not hold a firm, will not hold chairs if a firm has nuclear power. The CSR movement, the environmental movement remains opposed. I happen to disagree with that. Um, but there are a lot of issues which one could debate about. I mean, ethical funds, for example, um, a lot of them shun alcohol products. Well, a lot of people think, you know, drinking some wine is not the most, you know, horrible thing in the world. Um, you know, that shouldn't, that's unfair. Um, uh, should they shun, shun gambling companies? Well, yeah, we could disagree. Is that a form of recreation? Is it socially poor? Um, uh, uh, and um, so I think there's a lot of um, I think there's a lot of debate about a lot of those issues. And by the way, a lot of the funds also exclude defense contractors, which again, reasonable people could disagree whether they're responsible or irresponsible enough. Um, but I think uh, nuclear power is an interesting case, and um, I think the CSR movement basically um, sees nuclear power as bad and would not, the ethical mutual funds would not hold chairs in a firm. It's usually a sort of a veto for nuclear power. Um, I'm not sure that's a great idea. But I mean, I, I think the key point in all these issues is that, you know, corp responsibility is a politically determined concept. And what I might find as responsible, you might find as irresponsible, and vice versa. I mean, you know, there's a fund, for example, um, uh, in the, in, as a response to the ethical funds, called the SIN Fund, okay, which only invests in tobacco, alcohol, and gambling. And, and wep I'm sorry, and weapons. And weapons. Now, you know, well, the, pro the problem, they've tried to get into that. The problem is that most, most um, pornography in prostitution is not um, produced by publicly traded firms. So it's hard to buy. I mean, it's as simple as that, right? It's a huge industry, but it's hard to um, buy shares in it. Uh, well, I'm sure they would if they could. Um, so, um, and a lot of people think that's a cute, you know, that's sort of a cute idea. Uh, you know, the Catholic Church, by the way, has, a, has an ethical fund uh, which refuses to buy shares in firms involved in birth control and which, and which, give, and which, uh, and which uh, include abortion in their uh, health coverage. That's also, you know, they argue it's irresponsible to, uh, to, for a company to um, be complicit in um, destroying, you know, on the unborn. So there are a lot of, you know, these are issues on which reasonable people can disagree. It's not a holy grail. Sir. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, sharing, sharing these views with us. Uh, I, I think you would probably agree that this is an extremely complex yeah. uh, phenomenon and concept to try to get a hold of. Uh, Corporate social responsibility. Uh, two two uh, comments and then a, and then a question. Uh, Milton Friedman uh, famously wrote in 1970 in a New York Times article, right. "The social responsibility of business is to make a profit." Right. Period. Right. End of story. Right. And that has been widely discussed in right. the literature ever since. Second quotation: Profit is not the purpose of business. 
Profit is what makes the real purpose of business possible. David Packard. Uh, so those two kinds of concepts are somewhat at war with each other. Yeah. But the question I, I want to uh, pose to you is, all of your comments have been directed at publicly traded companies. Mm. Small business accounts for, what, 80% yeah, of the jobs in the right, country? Right. Uh, if you came to Vermont and spent a couple of months here studying uh, King Arthur Flower, Green Mountain Power, yeah. Flatbread Pizza, uh, or American Flatbread, uh, rather, and numerous other companies yeah. that have grown up from one or two employees yeah. and yeah. now have 150 employees, yeah. this is a core part of their whole being. Right. And I would argue, it makes them what they are. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I would say, I, 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 would, I agree. There is a niche market for such firms. I mean, uh, you know, the good news of the capitalist system is it's broad and open and flexible enough to, to make it possible for firms to have a real commitment to being responsible and virtuous and to be profitable. I completely agree. I think that's wonderful. Um, I don't want to generalize. I mean, my point is I don't think you can generalize from that to the whole economy. But is, are there business opportunities? Are there niches? Is it possibly both responsible and profitable? It sure is. Um, and uh, I think that's great. So I applaud that. On the Friedman issue, um, you know, the business case for corporate responsibility really accepts Friedman, ironically. Because if the, Friedman says you can do anything you want as long as you're doing it to make money. So for Friedman, if being more responsible makes you more profitable, then Friedman would say do it. And I think that's you know, partially why the business case is so exciting, is it doesn't require firms to trade off being responsible with being profitable. You can do both. The, the world is full of win-win stories. Um, and I think uh, the number of win-win stories is more limited. But I do think that Friedman, in a sense, ironically has won the day, though no one, though no one gives him credit uh, for it. Um, on profit being a means, Dave Packard, uh, I can't take that seriously. I'm sorry. I don't think H, you know, HP has done some pretty good things, some not so good things. I don't think HP is any different than, you know, reasonably good company, but, you know, I don't, I don't see it. Sir? Um, I like the point you made about uh, small businesses um, kind of depending more on, on good corporate responsibility. Well, some of them, a small minority niche, you know, let's not generalize. Okay. Some. All right. Well, you mentioned that. Um, a lot of consumers don't know where the, where the products they buy come from, and it's hard to find out. Right. Um, and um, it seems to me that lack of transparency is a, is a big hurdle for the effect that corporate responsibility has um, on increasing profits. And even in, even in um, big corporations and like mainstream culture movies like Blood Diamond and books like um, The Omnivore's Dilemma. Um, Who was the second? The Omnivore's Dilemma. Right. Yeah. I'd argue that those um, are increasing, you know, people's awareness of of where their products come from, and at least increasing the you amount know, that the average consumer um, is willing to dig down deep to look into where their products are coming from. And I'm just wondering what um, I mean. I, I share your kind of the cynicism about the effect that corporate responsibility has. Um, I come to profits right now. What do you think is the possibility of, of um, kind of mandating increases in transparency for some products that indirectly um, you know, motivate? Uh, yeah, no, I think an interesting idea. I mean, we do, of course, require um, foods to have lots of information about you know, where it comes from, um, uh, what's in it. There's nothing to prevent companies from voluntarily. Um, labeling their products. Companies are a little worried about doing that because someone will then find out that you know, they got something wrong. They're a little hesitant about you know, making too much of a fuss um, about that. Um, on the blood diamonds, um, you know, that's actually a pretty impressive success story um, in which uh, it's not, I don't think, driven by consumers. It's driven by Tiffany's and the major diamond you know, retailers who, um, who were worried that people, I don't think it was a fear, but it was a concern that people would, after all, diamonds are a pure manufactured good, in which case, that is to say, their, their price is dramatically more than cost to produce them. They're simply an artificially constructed vision of having something wonderful. Um, and so they are very vulnerable if suddenly diamonds were seen as 
uh, instead of a wonderful thing, um, a bad thing, that could be pretty catastrophic for that industry. So you'd walk around, someone would say, oh, is my diamond ring is going to engage it. You have a diamond? I can't believe what you, how could you do this? So you don't want that to happen. Um, so the industry has voluntarily um, uh, shaped up and they, and they monitor diamonds. Um, but, um, you know, if you're interested in that, you know, go, go to a jewelry store and, um, you know, ask them where the diamonds come from. Are they certified as not being blood diamonds? Um, you know, they might, you might find a little pamphlet somewhere in the back, but um, I don't see it as a, you know, they, it, was a, it was a fear and they got over it. On the food issue, finally, um, I think that this is the difference. I think that if people believe that a product makes them better off, they're likely to buy it. So organic food is a good example. Okay? A lot of people think organic food is healthier, tastes better. Okay? They may be right or wrong, but they think that. They're willing to pay for it. Okay? That's fine. You might buy a fluorescent light bulb because it saves you energy. Okay? In other words, these are so-called blended goods. They make the world a better place. They make you a better place. There's a market for those goods. When it comes to fair trade coffee, that's a purely altruistic good. The coffee is no different than any other coffee. I mean, it might, you might like it more or less, but it's just a matter of taste. It's so that, unlike organic, so, so it's not healthier, obviously. So in that sense, buying fair trade products is, I think, a purely altruistic act. And, you know, among people who buy premium coffee, which is a small portion of the population, uh, there's a segment of people who, will, who do buy fair trade products. And fair trade products, particularly fair trade coffee, we now have fair trade bananas, fair trade tea, you know, they, Fair trade chocolate is a big deal in Europe coming to the U.S. And there is a niche for those products. And there are people who are willing to be altruistic because uh, they don't cost a huge amount you know, when you buy them at the margin, et cetera. Um, so I think, that the, I think there is a market for those products as well. But I don't see it as a mainstream market. I just think at the end of the day, um, that people have other considerations they care about, like how the coffee tastes. Yeah. probably had a greater negative effects in the world than all of the negative uh, actions and taking the pursuit of profits. Yeah. 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 It seems like a pretty powerful statement. Yeah, well, it meant to be a product. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> uh, and um, is there any way uh, for this kind of notion to be tested, proven? Because it, I was, other than looking at anecdotal evidence and, and trying to you know, scan the newspapers, Right. Is there any way to get a real handle on is the world better off um, in the you know, rapid pursuit of um, yeah. no, no, but see, I wouldn't say, but I, I think it's a, quite a false alternative because I wouldn't say that the alternative is the, uh, just the, the pernicious pursuit of profits. It's, you know, it's one could pursue profits in a responsible sort of way. Um, so, but, and I don't think it's a cause. In other words, the CSR didn't you know, distract the companies from making money. Um, I think it'd be hard. I think it'd be hard to measure. Um, I don't know what one would do with the data when one got it. Um, I mean, we want firms to be, um, you know, both responsibly financially and responsibly um, and responsibly socially and environmentally. Um, uh, oh, but I, uh, but I do think there are, you know, there are there are times in which um, um, t t acting irresponsibly financially. I mean, as you. Current crisis, um, you know, has you know has enormously negative impacts. Um, I think it's an unusual time that has happened, um, but I do think it's worthy to to know. I think those you know hundred guys at AIG, you know, have done more damage to more people in the world than um, you know, lots and lots of horrible things. All the sweatshops in Asia, I mean, arguably, arguably, I'm, you know, I wouldn't bet my life on it, but I just. I think it's worthwhile thinking about. Yes? Um, I was going to ask, do you think that, uh, just thinking about Vermont and how on, on a small scale, yeah. you could argue that the state and the companies within the state are very um, socially responsible, and you could also make the argument that because in our current system in America, we are so far detached from where our products come from that, that that's why it doesn't really affect us. And I was wondering if you thought that with the economic crisis and kind of a move towards protectionism um, and making, uh, decreasing the internationality of products, would that kind of uh, serve as a platform essentially to 
encourage the government to start regulating what businesses do voluntarily? Yeah, I, mean, I, I hope we don't have an increase in protectionism because I think it's very bad. Um, um, you know, I think it could work the other way because, I mean, you know, what is the one one of the few firms which has prospered in the last, you know, six, six months to a year. Well, whose stock price has gone up dramatically, whose profits are increasing, it's Walmart. Why is everyone going to Walmart? Well, because times are hard and they want low prices. Walmart does 100, you know, Walmart is the single, you know, Walmart is the single largest importer of products from China in the universe, right? Okay. Uh, Walmart's, Walmart, Walmart, um, Walmart's cheap products have saved, saved Americans lots of money, thousands of dollars a family. Um, part of it's Walmart's efficiency. Part of it's their low American wages. And part of it's, of course, that it's the stuff is produced in developing countries. Um, so I think that um, uh, if you did see a movement toward protectionism, if Walmart had a source more domestically, prices would go up. Uh, you might get better regulation but people would be poorer as a result. Um, so I think that'd be a real trade-off. I don't know how that would play out, but I think there's a real trade-off there. Uh, I mean, Americans you know, have benefited enormously from all the material we import from developing countries. I mean, you know, all the garments we're all wearing now, right? 99% of them are made in developing countries. And they're all cheaper as a result. Go look at where your garments are made. Uh, you know, we have benefited from that. And I think, you know, cutting that off, not only, of course, would hurt lots of poor people who are being thrown out of their jobs, um, but also would raise prices um, and make, in that sense, make people worse off. So it's a tricky, it's a tricky, there could be real trade-offs. But I think the point you raise is a good one. Yes, in back. Sir. Um, what do you think the role of government should be in the market of virtue? Should they stay in, um, in the market of, in the market for virtue? Should they, should they stay? Right, right now you're saying that um, you don't see like corporate responsibility affecting or being profitable for companies. Right. But you also that through government intervention there could be ways where that could be made possible. Should the government do it? Do you think they will do it? Well, no, I mean, we do have lots of regulation. You know, all sorts of things um, in the United States and other countries. I mean, we have a lot of regulation. Um, well, I imagine the car example. Right, laws against discrimination. We have, you know, consumer protection laws. You can't put lead in children's products. We have, you know, thousands and thousands of regulations. Will they push back the corporate social responsibility profit law, or are you? Are you well, I, I think to the extent that you get regulation, companies then have to comply with it, and if they don't comply with it, they'll get fined and they'll become unprofitable. So it's a shifting target as regulation increases. Uh, it makes more business sense for companies to comply with the policies than they would do if it was voluntary. Um, to the extent you don't have regulation, then it remains voluntary. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic process. Um, as you have more regulation, um, then the boundaries of discretion diminish, and then companies, then the business case changes uh, and becomes greater. Uh, um, so, I mean, you know, 50 years ago, uh, well, you know, um, did it make business sense uh, to employ blacks in uh, companies in America? Iffy case, right? Now, you don't, you know, you discriminate against people on the basis of race, you get fined. So the business case has changed, but not because of public pressure, it changed because of regulation. The same thing's true with environmental, you know, environmental standards. So I, th it shifts the dynamic. Sir. Uh, adding on to that last question, how, how do you think government regulation of the regulations of corporate social responsibility would affect the profit margins, say like regulating carbon emissions, um, regulations on labor or wages? I think all those uh, regulations raise costs, and companies have to pass them on to consumers. I mean, there's no question. I mean, you know, cars, because of safety equipment and because of pollution control equipment, the average car is probably $1,000 more expensive, so, roughly. So basically, every time you buy a car, you're paying an extra $1,000 to make the car safer and cleaner. You have no choice. But if we didn't have those regulations, the car would be much cheaper. So if it's voluntary, it doesn't affect their profitability? Well, it means that everyone, if it's, if it's voluntary, it, it, it has, you know, if it's not voluntary, if it's required, then everyone has to do it. So it's a level playing field. If it's, uh, if it's voluntary, um, you know, there are times when it can make them more profitable. If it, being more responsible helps you. There are other times it could 
hurt you a little. Other times, it could not matter. In other words, it becomes less, I think it becomes less central. Um, but once the government requires it, then the dynamics um, you know, change very dramatically. So I mean, by definition, I see corporate responsibility as beyond the law. And if the law strengthens, then corporate responsibility moves on. So I don't think any firm who, who would, I don't think a firm which, discrim, which, is not, which treats women fairly, I don't think that's being responsible. That's complying with the law. Now a firm which gives, um, in many states, um, same-sex um, benefits, that's responsible because most states don't require it. Now if the law required it, then it would no longer be part of CSR. It would just be part of compliance. By the distinction you just made, and I'd like to ask you to back up and clarify it between regulation and you know voluntary standards, because it seems to me that what the CSR movement really is over a period of 30 years is a civil society movement that has pressed both on the regulatory mm. front and on the voluntary front, and a lot of what is now um, regulation actually started as you know, soft law CSR mm -hmm. expectations, and I think they go hand in hand, and actually nothing is more punitive for a company than consumer revenge on a brand name, much more than a you know a million dollar fine. So wouldn't it perhaps be useful to go back and look at CSR, maybe <coughs> redefine it and the boundaries between the regulatory and the voluntary being a little more flexible? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're probably I, I agree with you. I think historically you're probably right. I think much of the contemporary CSR movement is indifferent to government regulation. I mean they really see it as a substitute, which I think is very unfortunate. I think one of the reasons why a lot of business students and students like CSR is it doesn't require government. Um, so I, I think that, I think that has, has diminished, that, that, that gap has increased. I think it, and historically I think you're absolutely right. And I think, right, you do CSR, I think you can see that in climate change, right? You, companies do things voluntarily and then, yeah. So I think to the extent to which the two complement each other, that's good. I don't think it's always the case. But I disagree with the notion of uh, consumer revenge. Can you give me an example of a company which has really been hurt by consumer revenge in the United States? Well, I, I, I think a lot of the Wall Street firms are about to be hurt terribly. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I don't think the gap was hurt by, I don't think the gap was hurt by, by uh, consumer revenge on CSR, I mean. Can you well, give me I, when, the, when, the, when the president of Gap was here, actually, I mean, he said what, what you said. It was essentially you know, fear in their, you know, their yeah. brand name going down the toilet, I think, right. is actually the expression he used that got them to change their practices. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the evidence on Nike's Im negative impact is still um, ambiguous. Well, but I mean, when Michael Moore did that interview and, and put him on the spot about the sweatshops and right. the they had to change their policy. Yeah. No, no, okay. no, I completely agree that Nike responded to pressure. Okay, I mean, particularly you know the joke, you know, the story was you know you go to a, you live in Beaverton or Oregon, you work for Nike, you go to a party, someone says hi, how you doing? What do you do for a living? Oh, I work for Nike. Oh, that's that company that employs these three-year-old girls. Okay, so that's not cool. Um, uh, so I, I think that companies have responded to reputation fears. There's no question that's true. Um, but the real bottom line impact on consumer preferences is not so obvious. Um, uh, you know, Nike, you know, because we don't get, Nike won't give us the data. Um, there's a lot of the debate about how much Nike actually was suffered uh, from it. Um, uh, and um, their share price actually went down less than some of their competitors. The whole industry was suffering, et cetera, et cetera. On the Gap, I know the Gap firmly believes this. I know Fisher believes this. Uh, I've heard their executives speak. I guess at some level I think that they're paranoid. I think that they're wrong. I think that, you know, they really felt bad about these issues, being in San Francisco, picketing, um, you know, a lot of local pressures which made them shape up. Um, I know, that, I know the Gap takes this seriously. Um, I can't believe at the end of the day it really was as important as they think. But I could be wrong. I, I, don't, I could be wrong. I don't think it. I, I, I would argue no, but a lot of people disagree with me. I have a follow-up to Randy's question, and it, it's, a que it's a question that I began to formulate as you laid out in the beginning of your talk these hundreds of, of certifications. Yeah, kind right, of, right. And you, you subsequently claimed that it was businesses who were getting together and saying we had to do this. Often. Often. But in fact, very often it's civil society and, and an interesting yeah, exactly. we have with, Yes, I'm right. sorry. With, with activist press. Yes, yes, of course. So I, I wonder, 
and I think you've done an excellent job of, of making the case you have, and so, but it raises the question why the vibrancy of this movement that you began yeah. to talk about it, and obviously still, in many ways, I think it has had some good about it. So I wonder if there's a, a, a model where civil society is coming up with certification and so forth right. uh, as a, is a bit of a signaling device. Yeah, yeah. And essentially, I'm thinking of green building, I'm thinking yeah. of forestry, the list goes on. Yeah. They're not confident that those energies, I'm talking about civil society now, are gonna have any effect among elected officials. Right. So, but this is their way to say in the long term, social change can happen through the regulations, but we have to sort of prove it in the marketplace of ideas that consumers are responsible. Yeah, I, that, completely, yeah I agree. I agree completely. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. And that's what, again, I think that Randy is saying yeah. there's a, a yeah. dynamic. No, I agree. I agree. No, I should have mentioned, um, I, should, I should have mentioned that, um, no, uh, uh, civil society pressure on these codes is very important. Um, and they often play a big role in enforcing them, and particularly in the FSC, developing standards, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, but it, you know, the FSC is an interesting example. I mean, it's probably the case that whatever improvement in forestry practices we've had in the U.S. in recent years has been through FSC and voluntary standards, um, rather than through the, you know, forestry regulations. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I know the hope is that, I, you see this in climate change, where we get companies to do it voluntarily, it turns out that it doesn't cost them all that much money. Maybe it doesn't make them more profitable, it doesn't make them less profitable. And therefore, it then makes government regulation, the case for government regulation easier because the companies can, it's hard for them to argue this is going to destroy us. Yeah, I think there's something to that. I think there were some examples of it, not as many as I would like, but I think it is a phenomenon. Yes. I, I agree completely. You know, I, I, think, I, I agree. I think that's an important point. I got an easy, ask them for an easy question. <laughs> okay, okay. Sure. Sir. What is interesting about the new markets, um, Vermont, San Francisco, people that live in them, that made them not new markets? I think that's a good question. I mean, I've not studied that, you know, a lot. Um, that's a good question. I don't, I don't actually know. I don't, that's a good question. That's interesting. I don't know. There, are, there certainly is, um, you know, lots of local movements. Vermont actually is unusual, um, I think, in the country in the, in the concentration of these small niche businesses, people willing to buy them. Um, you know, less integration in the global economy, more of a sense of local identity. Um, uh, I think less likely to live in big cities probably plays a big role. Um, yeah, I'm just speculating. I've not looked into that, but I do think it's an interesting phenomenon worthwhile looking into. Yeah, um, I know we're growing. Everything, you know, everything is always growing in CSR. Um, growing, growing. Um, yeah, yeah, right. But, but it's a small, it's a small state. Um, you know, look, I mean, when I give this, when I've given talks over the years, um, the response of many people is, well, you just, you're too pessimistic. Okay, okay, that's fine. No, they say, I'm too pessimistic. Okay, and my response to them is, um, that's possible. And um, I'm making a prediction about what the world will look like 10 years from now. And I could be wrong. I mean, it's a, you make an argument, I could be wrong. Um, so I don't think I'm going to be wrong. <laughs> but you could be right. We'll see. It's, you know, we'll see 10 years from now. We'll get together and we'll see um, how, how much has grown. <laughs>